¿Dónde está la cámara? Me estoy perdiendo. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Isi Masuda, and I'm presenting my bachelor thesis, open-ended visual question answering, directed by Xavi Giro and co-directed by Santi Pascual. Before we start, some practicalities. Uh, here you can find the links for the thesis, our GitHub page, and the GitHub repo with all our, our software. And uh, well, this is going to be our roadmap throughout this presentation. I'm going to start with some, you know, um, problem definition, methodology, and well, finally present the results and wrap up with the conclusions on the future work. So to start, uh, yes. First of all, what's visual question answering? So visual question answering aims to build a model or an artificial intelligence system that, uh, given uh, two inputs, the an image and a question. Its output is the answer of the, this question. Uh, and I want to highlight this because this is one of the, the main goals of this project. And I think you need to, to keep this in mind throughout all the presentation. So let me rephrase that in a more like common sense words. Our goal here is to create a model that is able to predict an answer of, the, of a given question related to an image. And by related to an image, I mean that if you give an image to this model and ask questions about this image, uh, the model is supposed to predict the, the answer of those questions. And by motivation, so, okay, why should we be doing this? And there's a lot of, you know, uh, echo in the media about artificial intelligence and in the science fiction, movies, uh, literature. But, and of course, uh, visual question answering is a little bit in, inside this artificial in intelligence world. So these are a little bit one of the mo first motivations, but also uh, a recurrent one in some of the papers about visual question answering is uh, the new visual Turing test. They are proposing visual question answering as being uh, the new Turing test because uh, it exploits a little bit more the, the uh, capabilities of these models to understand images and to process somehow the uh, questions. And we'll see that in uh, some slides later. And in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, there's been, the, the past few years, there's been like, kind of exploding the number of papers uh, regarding this multidisciplinary task, uh, joining, for example, computer vision, natural language processing, and knowledge representation and reasoning, which is the case of uh, visual question answering. And this is due to the fact that these models that join this task can, can perform much more complex tasks than what you can achieve using, for example, only computer vision or natural language processing. And if you take a look into these models, you can see that these, uh, these models uh, perform these sub-problems of, of each of these uh, different fields, and they kind of join them together. And to see that with an example, this is a real example from the data set we are using. As you can see, the question is, what is Bob in, in the water other than the boats? And the answer is boys. And to have a model able to answer this, uh, first of all, it needs to recognize what is the water, what is the boats, and what is the relationship between them in the image, so bobbing. And it has to find uh, those objects in the image and kind of subtract them to find the other object that is bobbing in the water, in this case, boys. So it also needs to uh, recognize this, this new object called boys. And to perform this, you can, you, you've seen that there's a lot of uh, different uh, sub-problems like object recognition, and also it needs a lot of understanding of the question. So this is where the merging of these fields appear. Another of the motivations for this project is our kind of end goal of, the, of this research line, which is the uh, generation of question answering question answers, which is uh, build a model that is able to create a question and, a, and its related answer given an image. We'll explain that in the future work at the end of this presentation. And of course, we also have this uh, visual questioning challenge, which is the, the biggest uh, challenge for visual question answering task, and it's kind of embedded in the CVPR uh, 2016. And they propose actually a different kind of subtask for visual question answering, which are, well, you can see them here. The first one, the first split is between real images or abstract scenes. This is kind of the type of image you are uh, giving to the model. And the second one is if the answers are open-ended or multi-choice. Open-ended means that uh, they, they expect the model to answer with a kind of uh, natural language answer. And the multi-choice one is uh, they give to the model, apart from the question and the image, a set of uh, predefined answers. And the model has to predict which one of those is the correct one. 
here I just uh, put four of them, but actually the data set gives you 18 choices. And we are focusing on real images, open-ended answers, because we thought that it's most more interesting in terms of research and maybe in uh, real-world applications. And okay, for, uh, to develop all these models, I've been talking about artificial intelligence, but actually uh, our tool, we are going to use like deep learning techniques. And just to uh, say what it is in a couple of sentences, deep learning is using the already known uh, artificial neural networks from machine learning, and they are kind of stacking these layers one after the other to create this kind of uh, deep models, hence the name deep learning and the, or deep neural networks. And th this way they achieve to uh, perform state-of-the-art uh, accuracies in a lot of problems, such computer vision or, well, object recognition and such tasks. But in, inside deep learning, we are going to use uh, convolutional neural net networks, which are were first presented by the Alex Krzyzewski using the, this so-called AlexNet, which is one of the famous, famousest architectures. And these convolutional neural networks uh, basically have two, two kinds of layers. The first one is the convolutional layers, which, uh, e where each neuron is connected to a small region in the input. And it, it's performing a, a typical convolutional filter. But the cool thing here is that the, the weights of this filter are not like um, pre-established, but learned uh, in the training process. And the other ones are these uh, fully connected layers here, or dense layers, where each neuron is connected to the whole uh, input they have. So th they are losing this special information. So it, in a way, you can see them as a one-dimensional layer. And to process the question, uh, we are using this uh, word or sentence embeddings. And to explain this, uh, this means that what we are doing here is uh, taking a word and its representation uh, as one hot encoding, meaning that you have a vector of as many dimensions as words in your uh, pre-established dictionary with all zeros and just a one in the position of your word. And you're taking this uh, sparse and highly dimensional uh, representation because it can take 20,000, 80,000, or 100,000 dimensions and project it into a latent space, which we call the semantic space, much more like condensed. And the cool thing here is that uh, this space uh, it's semantic, meaning that uh, the words, for example, that has they, they have a, a relation between them are projected close to each other. So, for example, uh, the first experiment here by Soker, if you can see, if you uh, take the word France and its embedding, you can see that the closest embeddings to, it, to this word are other countries or at least some geographical words, or for example, Xbox, some game devices. And another cool uh, thing you can do with these uh, word embeddings is take uh, the second experiment here, is that if you take uh, these words and project them, and then you take images and use this learned embedding to project those images into this uh, same semantic space, you can see that, for example, uh, images which contain cat, which are the uh, red cross, are uh, projected close to the actual word cat. So this image projection is also, in a way, um, with semantic sense. Also, to process these, uh, the text sequences, we are using long, long short-term memory networks. This is a lo uh, LSTM block or cell, and a network is just a, a connection of multiple of them. And the good th uh, thing here is that these uh, cells have this kind of long, um, long memory. So th they are good at processing sequences. And it, they are an improvement of recurrent neural networks, which they only keep this short-term memory. So we are going to use this to process the, also the text sequences. But in terms of visual question answering, what is already out there, uh, thinking a lot of papers we've been reading, uh, the common structure of all of them, or schema, is that uh, you usually, and we also will be implementing this schema too, you take the, the image and you extract some kind of visual features or descriptors, and then you process the same way the, the question using embeddings. So at the end you have a, a vector representation of both the image and the question, you merge them somehow, and then you use this merge uh, representation to predict the answer. And uh, I would like to uh, put this ex counter example, and well, you could argue that it's not a counter example, but because it's quite curious uh, wha what are they doing, they, instead of doing this merge processing, what they do is, okay, as visual question answering performs these subtasks uh, depending on the question, they are kind of creating a new model for each question, so uh, the um, the lower um, network, which is called parameter prediction network, is processing the question so it can predict weights for a layer in the classification network. So the, 
the above part is just the a common uh, CNN architecture, which they are injecting some weights to to modify the the model at test time. And what actually we've been doing is working with the visual question dataset, which is the dataset provided by the visual question challenge organizers, which prov uh, provides you with these three kind of subsets with images, questions, and answers, and they are already splitted uh, with the typical train validation and test sets except answers, of course, because uh, this is what you are supposed to do. And you can see that there are like a huge number of samples. For example, in image, you have more than 80,000 uh, images, and answers, you have more, almost 2.5 million. And why is that? It's because for each image, they are giving you three questions associated to it. And for each question, you have 10 valid answers. And I say valid because they've been human annotated. And you'll see the impact of this in the metric, some slides after this. So we started with a text-based approach because uh, this is already at least more uh, more research about. And we started taking this model, this architecture, which the the goal of this text-based question answering is you give it an answer, uh, uh, sorry, a story and a question, and you want to predict the answer of the question related to the story. So first of all, we started uh, doing this word embedding of both the story and the question. But in the question, we give this word embedding to an LSTM, as we've been talking about this kind of process, these sequences. And what this LSTM achieves is to, in a way, accumulate all the information of the words of the question. And once it has seen the whole question, it, it outputs a single vector. And you may notice that in the upper branch, the story branch, you have like n vectors, which one for each word. And in the lower one, in the question, you only have a single one representing the whole question, which, which is called certain sentence embedding. So that's why we need this repeat uh, block here. And then as they kind of lie in the same space, we can add them together to merge them. And we give this representation to another LSTM, which is going to accumulate all the story. And once it has seen the whole story, then you have this representation of both the story and the question. And now you can predict the answer using the softmax layer, which is a fully connected one which uh, is predicting actually a uh, one hot representation of the single word answer. So here we are predicting answers with only one word. Then we take this model and we say, OK, we want to do this for visual question answering. So uh, for us, our story, our the thing, it uh, encapsulates the information to answer the question is the image. So we replace the story branch for an image branch. Uh, and we process it using the VGC16, which is a common architecture pre-trained with a uh, large data set called ImageNet. But instead of using the whole uh, model, we truncate it until the last convolutional layer. And we use this output as our feature map, which is called. Then flatten and repeat those vectors. And for the question, as it was the only sequence that we have now, we decided to go like simple at the beginning and don't use this, the sentence embedding, but only the word embedding. And as the representation of the question and the image uh, are dif with different dimensions, so we decided to concat them to, to merge. And then the last part is exactly the same as the, the previous model. Uh, this, the previous model, this one, uh, had a lot of problems in terms of uh, memory constraints, time constraints. We, we needed like 17 to 40, uh, 24 hours to train a single epoch. So we decided to move that towards uh, pre-computed uh, visual features. And at that time, we were kind of collaborating with uh, UB, and they provided us with these uh, visual features uh, they were working with called uh, kernelized CNN, well, extracted uh, from a kernelized CNN architecture. So actually, this model here is not like ours. These this were provided by the UB, and we take these visual descriptors and apply the same architecture as before. And this is how we could achieve the first like complete training and we start uh, tweaking a little bit the model to, to improve the results. Uh, we had a batch normalization, which is uh, a layer that tries to normalize the, the statisticals of the whole batch. So it's supposed to be easier then for the model to train and to achieve better results. And we'll see that in the results uh, part. And also here, I'm just showing the architectures, but we also start playing with the learning rate, with the uh, embedding size, also with the um, dropouts. So there are some hyperparameters that we were just adjusting here. And finally, we achieved to our final model, which is the one we presented to the visual question answering uh, challenge. And here we decided to implement the sentence embedding we already have in, this, in the text-based uh, model. 
and we were thinking, okay, uh, that it would be cool to have the same uh, feature that I've shown you in uh, previous example, where you projected the image into a semantic space, and it was kind of close to their uh, related work. It, that, that would be cool for our images. So we decided to add a fully connected layer uh, here after the visual descriptors to project the, these uh, features into the same semantic space as the question. So now everything kind of lies into this uh, latent space, common latent space. And for the question, as I already said, uh, we're using this sentence embedding. So now as both are in the, have the same dimensions, are in the same space, we can add them together. So this is actually kind of a small uh, operation of, we have this vector representing the image, and in the same space, another vector representing the question, and we're just, just adding them to, to have the embedding or to predict the embedding of the answer. And once we have this embedding of the answer, we can give it to the softmax layer to predict the actual one hot encoding of this answer. And to see uh, the results of these uh, models, first we need to define the uh, metric evaluation, which is provided by the visual question answering uh, organizers. And this means, uh, this metric only, the meaning of this metric is that you need to uh, achieve uh, an answer prediction which is which have a match with at least three other answers. So if you remember, the, the, each question has 10 valid answers associated. So if you, your answer is exactly the same as at least three of them, you have 100% of accuracy on that question. And if not, for each match, you have like one third. But actually, uh, digging a little bit into the results, we've seen that uh, maybe this formula is not accurate because they are doing some kind of uh, rounding here, so they are not giving you like 0 0.33 or 0 0.66 or 1 of accuracy, but 30, 60, 90, or 1. So actually, to have 100% of accuracy, you need to have four or more matches. And then uh, they also provide a script to do some kind of preprocessing to unify all these uh, answers. So with that, we achieved 53.62% uh, uh, of accuracy in the visual question answering using our late, uh, latest model. And this was evaluated on the test standard data set partition using uh, the real image open-ended uh, subtask. But uh, this is a good number, but to see that in a little bit of context and in detail, uh, the last one is the, the one we presented to the, to the challenge. And this, the other ones are some other tests we've been doing. Uh, so in test set, you can see that they split the results into yes, no, number, or other. These are uh, answer types. So the, as you can see, it's much easier to, an to answer correctly the, the questions that are supposed to be answered with yes or no than, for example, other. Because other, for example, is questions like why is this, which it needs more reason, reasoning capabilities. But to see that in, in much um, kind of context with the baseline, we first need uh, to know where are we as like humans, if we do this challenge and we evaluate ourselves with the same metric, uh, we have an accuracy of 83.3%, uh, which is quite low. And that m might tell us that maybe this metric is not the best one to use in visual question answering. And then uh, the, the next four ones are for baselines the organizers provide. The first one is, okay, forget about deep learning and uh, machine learning, just answer yes to each question. And with that, we, they achieve 29% uh, of more or less uh, accuracy, which tells us, us that the data set is kind of biased to, uh, or at least not normalized towards these yes answers. And then they started uh, offering different type of models, such as providing the, the most common answer for each question type, uh, and then more machine learning such, such as near, nearest neighbors. And finally, the actual like baseline of deep learning using LSTMs and CNNs, which is, uh, has an accuracy of 54.06%. Uh, and these are the winners of the challenge. <clears throat> as you can see, the, the gap between the baseline and the winners maybe is not uh, that much, meaning that these tasks are quite tough. And as I already mentioned, we are here in 53.62%. And as you may wonder, is why, why are we below the baseline? And this is, has a like, really uh, reasonable explanation. The, their models, and as you will see uh, in some slides later, they are using a classifier upon the most common answers, meaning that their model is, in, in training time, they are taking the, hundred, the thousand most common answers <coughs> as a hard coded, like a string, like this is the table or whatever. 
and they are building a classifier upon these thousand question uh, answers. So their model is unable to, to answer things that it has not seen. And of course, this is easier to train, and uh, your uh, accuracy in this specific uh, challenge is going to be higher. But we thought that we, we already know that they were doing this, but we thought that it would be more interesting in terms of research to create a model that instead of building classifier, it's able to generate new answers. So it's able to answer things that it hasn't seen before in training time. So that's why that one of the main reasons we our uh, accuracy is below the baseline. The other one is that we, we started with this model that is able to answer only single word answers. And of course, there are multiple, uh, multiple word answers in the data set. So for those, we don't have like 100% of accuracy. And that's a little bit also why we are below this uh, baseline. But, and to see a little bit some qualitative results of our model, this is the last model. You can see the type of questions they are answering and they are in the data set and the images. They are all from Microsoft Coco and the accuracy they are giving. These are just some examples to see what kind of task you have to perform. And these are some statistics that the, the organizers provide at the CBPR some couple of days before. Uh, and as you can see, uh, a lot of people is using BCG Net, but we are in the other, in the, we are, as we are using this kernelized CNN architecture. And also for the question modeling, uh, we are with the LSTM as many people. But the, the main one, and that's what I want to highlight, is that we are in the 16% of the, of the teams that, w that we used uh, generation answers. So a lot of them, 84%, as you can see, they are using classification. This is most of the people inside baseline towards the, um, uh, the winner. But uh, this is like, uh, we were only one of the few teams that actually performed this generation of answers. And to highlight this, I want to say that our model uh, here innovates using this answer generation approach and using this kernelized CNN visual features uh, extractor. And one of the things I want, uh, I think it's worth to mention is that uh, a guy, uh, one of the participants from the winner team explain, uh, said his concern about uh, all these teams uh, building these classifiers instead of generation, generating answers because it's kind of a criticism uh, of these tasks that are focused to win these challenges, but once you remove and once you put them in the real world, maybe they don't have much sense. And some additional results: we already uh, we um, presented our extended abstract to the visual question answering workshop to CBPR. It was accepted, so we were invited to present our poster there. And this was kind of our ticket to Las Vegas, where this year celebrates the CBPR 2016. And Xavi was there uh, explaining our poster and and ab abstract. So just to wrap up now, some conclusions. Uh, with this project, we achieved to present our model to the visual question answering challenge. We start uh, learning how to use these uh, more text processing techniques in the uh, deep learning framework, as we are from computer vision group. And we create an scalable visual question answering model, which means that we now can attach some kind of uh, answer generation model to, uh, to create multiple world answers. Uh, and also, we, one of our goals was building a reusable software package, because in terms of research, sometimes uh, their open source code is a little bit a mess. And of course, we presented this extended abstract to the visual question answering workshop. And taking every, all this in, in mind, our next steps to, in this research line, we want to add a uh, decoder for the multiple word answers. So we build our architecture is like an encoder that we set, and we want to attach a decoder stage so we are able to, to predict multiple word answers. We also want to try a character embedding instead of the sentence embedding, which probably gives us a representation with both semantically and syntactically uh, sense. And also, of course, implement our extended abstract, which is this uh, architecture here. And well, thank you very much. Uh, I want to ha um, thanks to Xavi Giro and Santi for their guidance, and Albert Gil for, uh, uh, for his uh, um, help with the GPI resources usage, and also, of course, family and friends. And thank you all for coming. Uh, now, if you have any questions. Juan, Juan, Sí.